It would be fun to ask him uh, to give a talk that he hasn't given in like over five years. And he was happy to oblige, namely back doors to typical case complexity. Thanks. Uh, so I want to apologize from the start that I have a little bit of a sore throat, so uh, the audio quality will be bad. And so those of you out there watching the video, it's, it's my throat. It's not actually the mic. Um, okay. So this is, yeah, some really old work that I did. Um, with Carla Gomez and Bart Selman on uh, a topic that uh, a lot of people here are very interested in. So there's been a lot of significant progress, as you saw in other talks, such as Kevin's, on complete search methods for SAT solving. And by complete, I mean that the algorithm has zero error. It always either tells you SAT or unsat. Okay. Um, but you can still have randomness in such a thing. It just has zero error. So in Verification of software and hardware, such methods are very critical. So finding uh, bugs or checking for bugs, uh, finding exploits in software, SAT solvers have been used for that. And the basic paradigm is to reduce the bug finding problem or the exploit finding problem to a huge CNF SAT instance. Okay, say one million variables and five million clauses. The current state of the art in SAT solving can often handle such things. And then to check unset with a super optimized backtracking based solver. So checking unset is, amounts to saying that there is no bug. For all possible ways to try to force a bug, there isn't one. Okay? Uh, so by backtracking based, I mean the following specific type of paradigm. So you have some heuristic which is choosing a variable for you. And there's some very complicated ways in which you might do that by analyzing the instance. Then you have uh, some heuristic which will try a value for that variable. Let's say in the case of Boolean sat, it's true or false. And then you recurse the algorithm on a simplified instance that has that variable plugged in. And as you plug in variables, you may make some parts of the formula simpler. And so you have some polynomial time algorithms which will simplify things for you. And so there's some kind of propagation of values of things. And eventually, you'll either have sort of tried all possibilities in some limited sense and found that it's unsat in all cases or you'll have find a, found a satisfying assignment. So that's what I mean by backtracking based. And this paradigm is just used over and over. So, um, so one view from practice is the following quote by Bart Selman. Our world may be friendly enough to make many typical reasoning tasks polytime, challenging the value of the conventional worst case complexity view in CS. Okay, this is very provocative. This is my own co-author after we wrote the paper, actually. So, uh, so in this talk, we formalize one way to talk about what friendly enough means, so one, one way to think about what that means, within a worst case complexity perspective, actually. Uh, we're just gonna restrict the kinds of instance we're looking at, okay? But still a worst case type of perspective. So there's a huge theory practice gap here, as others have mentioned. So the amazing performance of these SAT solvers seems to be in conflict with the idea that SAT is actually hard. So instances from these domains are surprisingly easy, yet the best known worst case algorithm for 3SAT we have still runs in some exponential time. So what makes so many practical instances easier? Um, so one proposed answer is that there's hidden tractable substructure somewhere in these real world problems. Structure that doesn't exist in general. Um, so our specific structure that we're going to look at here are things that we call backdoors or backdoor sets of variables. Okay. So the initial motivation for looking at these kinds of things was uh, in heavy-tailed running time distributions of randomized backtracking solvers. So some types of problems, such as Latin square completion problems and things like that, when they were solved by randomized backtracking, you would get a runtime distribution that has a surprisingly fat tail on it. And just to give a little more formality what that means, the running time will be at least t with probability proportional to 1 over t to alpha. Alpha is some small positive constant. Um, so the main message here is that that would explain why one would see a 
wide different range of solution times. So Kevin was reporting earlier that you get things in the order of milliseconds to days. So you see some really short runs, and other times you see really long runs for no particular reason, it seems. So how to explain these short runs? That's what we were interested in. Because what often happens when you get a distribution like this, you just do random restarts. Because you know that there's some significant fraction of the possible running times that will actually be short. You just keep trying to get lucky and hit one of those. So the, uh, informally, what we proposed was this idea of a backdoor set. So a backdoor to a given combinatorial problem instance is a subset of variables such that once you assign the right values to those variables, the remaining instance simplifies to something that is tractable. Okay, that's just informally. So more formally, we have to say, what do we mean by tractable? So we define the notion of a subsolver, some sort of thing akin to these polynomial time heuristics built into the solver. And then we distinguish between two types of backdoors. Um, so strong backdoors, which can be used to determine unsatisfiability, and normal backdoors, which are used to uh, determine satisfiability. So the definition of a subsolver is the following. Um, intuitively, it's these polynomial time propagation algorithms that you have uh, in a backtracking solver after you set, say, a couple of the variables to something. So a subsolver, A, given as input a formula, satisfies the, the following properties. So it either rejects the input, okay, it says I just don't know, or it determines it correctly as unsatisfiable or satisfiable. Retur returning a solution is satisfiable. But somehow if it says unsat, then you can prove that it actually is unsat. And then the thing has to be efficient, has to run in polynomial time. Uh, it has to satisfy just some very basic criteria in order to prove theorems about it. So it can determine if a formula is trivially true, has no clauses whatsoever, no constraints, or trivially unsatisfiable, has an empty clause, a contradictory clause. Things would just say false. And then there's a fourth property, which is sometimes used in the literature for backdoors and sometimes not. Um, because some propagation heuristics are sort of polynomial subcases don't satisfy this thing. It's called self-reducibility. And it says basically, if an algorithm determines whether a formula is sat or unsat, then if I take any variable in any possible value for it, it could be a bad one, if I plug it in, I get a simplified formula, and A can determine that one too. So there, uh, this is satisfied by a lot of things. For example, if the subsolver solved 2sat, if I plug in variables to 2sat, I don't go outside of 2sat, um, horn sat, things like that. But in other cases, you don't get this kind of property. Like, suppose my subsolver checks for the all zero assignment. And if that doesn't work, then it says, OK, I don't know. <laughs> then plugging in a 1 there, then it may or may, may not work. Okay. So this definition is still general enough to encompass many polynomial time uh, propagation methods that are used in practice, including those where we don't have like some nice syntactic characterization of what's going on. We just have a bunch of heuristics and they work. Uh, but the notion makes perfect sense for other types of constraint problems, not just SAT. So just general constraint satisfaction, mixed integer programming, things like that. Okay, so that's a subsolver. So what's a backdoor set? So the definition of a backdoor is that it's a subset of the variables with respect to some solver A. So it's a set S with respect to some A if there is some assignment to that subset so that A will return a satisfying assignment when you plug in that, the variable assignment for that subset. Okay? So this works for satisfiable instances. There's a notion of strong backdoors, which is there's a subset so that no matter what assignment, partial assignment, you plug into this subset, this subsolver A will be able to take care of the rest of it and either conclude sat or unsat. And so identifying a strong backdoor and trying all possible assignments to that, you could, in principle, conclude unsat for such a formula. Okay? 
So the first big note is that backdoors are algorithm dependent, very, very algorithm dependent. It depends on what sol sub solver you're using uh, as to whether or not you have a small backdoor or a large one. So. so what we found in practice a while back is that backdoors can be surprisingly small on a bunch of different instances and this can help explain why a solver gets lucky on some runs mainly because these backdoors are identified early on in the search. So here's just five uh, things that out of the list that we did. So here we have some thousand variable instances. So this is like a logistics planning problem. This is a circuit uh, doing a three bit adder. This is some part of a pipeline processor verification. This is a, a quasi group or Latin squares completion problem. It's a combinatorial problem. And in each of these cases, you find that uh, with respect to um, the sat z heuristics, so it's just some very strong uh, polynomial time heuristics that are used. But I mean, I say heuristic here, but we know that they, they, when they say sat or unsat, they're correct. Okay, and it's just that we, they, we don't know like why they work. Okay, so the back door set for these things it turns out to be rather small. And there's been a lot of follow-up work since these things. Uh, so I just want to refer you to a survey by my co-authors as well as uh, Kautz and Savarwal from 2007. Um, it's a very nice survey with lots of, of uh, more examples than this. Hey, yeah. Did you find those methods by the random or the intermediate ones and then going on the order? So. Um, so we found them by, by uh, using these dis different heuristics and by just sort of uh, kind of brute forcing in some, in some cases. So we use heuristics up to a point and then we try to, to sort of brute force. We try to sort of cut off the search as early as possible. So... But like, you wouldn't try all... No, you couldn't, all, you couldn't try all 2 of the 53. We didn't brute force the whole thing. It could be that there's a smaller backdoor there. That's just the largest one. That, that we got. Yeah, I mean, it's basically just from sort of analyzing the number of times that uh, the sat z uh, heuristic actually backtracked. So the number of times it actually failed to uh, find a satisfying assignment. What's the last column? Oh, this is just the fraction. This is just the ratio of, of this one over that one. I'm sorry. Just showing that it's small, I don't know, as if the numbers... Yeah, not enough. Okay. It's like without a ratio, how can we ever interpret what's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I have an animation, okay, so I'm doing okay on time. Um, so there's some nice animation that my co-authors came up with um, to try to visually show you what's going on and like where this kind of structure uh, gets exploited. So. This is an instance with, a, I think, about 800 variables. Um, so this is the variable variable graph, meaning that for each variable we have a node, and we put edge between two nodes if they, there's some clause that has both of them. Okay, And so here we have some loosely connected variables, and here we have some variables which are very, very tightly wound up in the middle. Okay, And so there's so we have an animation uh, here where as you plug in variables, nodes uh, disappear so, and things get smaller, but you may uh, backtrack. So as you backtrack, you introduce the node again because you failed uh, to find an assignment. And so this is just with a random selection of variables to branch on, not just some sort of uniform random selection. So you see there's like a lot of things that are still working on this hardcore a lot and it will eventually conclude on set. So it's like a before and after picture and you see the before picture is very very um, elaborate. Okay, I think I'm tired of this before picture. Okay, um, it goes I think it only goes for 50 seconds, but it feels like a lifetime when you're up here. <laughs> I mean, anyway, uh, so 
the, uh, the after picture. So this is basically when you use the heuristics of the SAT solver. Uh, so this thing has a backdoor of size 16, and basically the, the key, just at a very intuitive level, is to pick variables uh, out here on the fringes, which simplify the thing, and then uh, this nasty thing gets uh, proven unsat pretty quickly. So, yeah, okay. So, anyway, that gives you some idea of uh, the of the fact that there's this uh, structure there. So, well, so what's the intuition here? Uh, so, imagine this is a blob of all possible CNF formulas. Okay, so there are certain pockets of this blob that can be solved efficiently, and we know about those pockets. These are or so-called islands of tractability, okay? And the idea is that many real-world instances um, happen to fall in a space which is rather close to one of these islands. So a small backdoor set intuitively means that this problem instance is close to one of these different islands of tractability, and after setting a small number of variables, we arrive at, at one of these islands. And moreover, uh, the solvers in practice with their variable choice heuristics are able to pick out um, sub supersets of backdoors which which are good. So one thing I want to emphasize is that the existence of such things is not tautological. So I didn't set things up just so that it would automatically be true. So just because a problem instance is solved efficiently in practice but, you know, and the subsolver happens to be this one used in practice. That doesn't necessarily imply that the instance must have a small back door with that subsolver. Okay, for example, it could be that even the smallest back doors are somewhat large, but there are many of them, and so the solver gets lucky because it just tries anything at all, and because there's so many of them, it works. And so, one observation I want to point out is because of the self-reducibility property of subsolvers. If we have a small backdoor, which works, um, say, for proving SAT, then that implies that there are many large backdoors. Because this self-reducibility property says that um, if an algorithm, my subsolver determines a formula, then it will determine all the subformulas you get from plugging in variables. So this means that even if I pick a superset of the backdoor set and plug in the right values, that will also work. So having a small backdoor entails that you can have many large backdoors, just those that contain this backdoor set, this small one. The full satisfiability makes sense that you don't need the full refutation. Yeah, for refutation, it's not as, not as clear. Um. I don't know. I mean, I think. You mean, could it be that refutation works quickly without a backdoor at all? Um, for this a strong, strong backdoor. For this, type for this type of algorithm. I don't. Not sure. <laughs> Maybe. So, the empirical fact that we often encounter small backdoors in problem instances shows that these problem instances are special. And uh, to emphasize that further, I just want to point out that most formulas with respect to the typical subsolvers we think about, polynomial time, special cases of SAT, they do not have weaker, uh, strong, small backdoors. So let A be some subsolver that handles two-set, horn-set linear equations. So with high probability, if I pick a sufficiently large clause density D, a random case set instance with n variables in D and clauses will have minimal backdoor set of some linear size. And the intuition is very simple. With high probability, our backdoor set of variables is going to have to do a lot of work to get close to horn or two set or linear equations or anything like that. So it must hit many clauses in order to simplify a, a, a completely random KCNF instance. Okay, so this tells you that well, for most instances you see, you won't have a small backdoor set. So the fact that there are these really small ones means, it further emphasizes that uh, these instances in practice are very, very special. And this helps explain why randomized backtracking can perform poorly on large random tree set. So there's small backdoor set for this subsolver? 
Yeah, yeah. For a subsolver that handles, say, these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we always have to talk about you know, which one. But, right, if I took a subsolver which was like, had survey propagation embedded in it, maybe then you have a totally different story. Right. Yeah. And just another note, uh, every satisfiable casing air formula you can show has a backdoor of non-trivial size in a certain sense. And these can be pulled out from um, sort of old work on uh, KSAT algorithms. So, for example, if you have a subsolver that does unit propagation, uh, so by that I mean uh, when you have a one CNF clause, a clause with exactly one variable, then you set it to the right value so that this clause is true. Okay, so that's unit propagation. And so if you have something like this, then every satisfiable case you know, formula contains a backdoor set of some constant fraction size that's uh, less than n. So this implies uh, pretty quickly that you have a faster than 2 to the n k set algorithm for each k. And just to give another observation, so if you have one of these subsolvers which doesn't satisfy this self-reducibility property, say it tries all zeros and all ones, then every satisfiable formula contains a backdoor set of size at most n over 2. <laughs> okay. So you can think about why that's true. But yeah, so depending on which subsolver you use, you get different sizes, some non-trivial size. So uh, there's been quite a bit of work on theoretical algorithms that try to solve various problems, assuming that small backdoors are in there. So a naive upper bound, of course, this is just try all uh, k sets of variables if you have a backdoor set of size k, and then try all possible assignments. But when k is, is say, some constant fraction of n, you can get slight improvements over this bound by just some uh, simple uh, randomness tricks. So expo again, exploring this self-reducibility property, you can pick a, a subset slightly larger than your estimate of the minimum backdoor, and with good probability, you know, some good less than two the one over two the n probability, your backdoor will lie in the superset, and then trying all possible assignments there, you get some tiny improvement. But this, I mean, this, again, this is a sort of theoretical uh, curiosity, and so here's this kind of example theorem of the kind of things you see, so uh, Nishimura, Ragda, and Sider show that for subsolvers that can recognize Horn, 2CNF, and linear equations, say, finding a strong backdoor of size k is something which is FPT. So it can be solved in 2 to the order k times poly n time, instead of something like n to the k here. And there's another notion uh, of deletion backdoor, which is basically a set of variables such that once you just delete them completely from the formula, then you can solve it. Okay. This is another natural notion of being close to tractable, sort of measuring the distance uh, from tractability. And there are many FET results for finding deletion backdoors of size k. I just wanted to say this buzzword so you'd have something to Google if you're interested. Okay. And there are also many hardness results. I mean, finding uh, a small back door if, or a minimum size back door if one exists is intuitively an MP hard problem to solve in general. But uh, so for most subsolvers used in practice, if we could find a size K back doors in, in uh, FPT, then you could solve MP problems in SEDEX time. Okay. So this is a different set of subsolvers from these. <laughs> okay. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention some related work. So this is a fairly basic idea of having some uh, distance to uh, solvability. So there is some work uh, that predated ours in operations research. Uh, so there they call them control sets. So these are small sets of variables for a formula so that once these variables are, say, deleted or set to the right value, the resulting formula has some nice property. So often the properties they were looking at were uh, monotonicity, is the formula monotone or not. But clearly this is a uh, very related notion. Okay. And in parameterized algorithms, there was some work after ours uh, concerning distance from triviality. So the idea is very basic. Suppose one can make k edits to some problem instance so that then it becomes easy to solve. And presumably these edits 
would preserve solvability, say satisfiability of the thing, can we then solve the instance in, in uh, parameterized uh, fixed parameter track also. Um, so there some work on that, so just again, something you can Google if you wish. So I want to give some uh, final thoughts and uh, food for thought for this crowd. So we propose some notion of a backdoor set of variables. It tries to isolate the hard part of a problem instance in the real world so that once you set this hard part, the rest becomes easy. And many real world instances have been shown to have these small things with respect to the modern set solver heuristics that are used. And these solvers uh, are exploiting it. So one is, why are they there? It's a big final thought. So, okay, we know that these problems are extremely structured. Problems with thousands of variables have a uh, dozen variables so that if you set it, the whole thing is easy. So, but are there deeper reasons? There has to be deeper reasons why these things are there at all. So why do they exist in practice but not on average? Um, I mean, is it be just because of the way that circuits are designed that these circuit instances look like this? And another question is, our framework is algorithm dependent, right? So we were saying that we have a backdoor with respect to this algorithm or that algorithm. Is this necessary? Um, I don't know. So I mean, maybe there's a universal subsolver, some notion of that, like some kind of Levin-style enumeration over all polytime heuristics. Now I haven't figured out a good formulation of that, but but maybe there's some way to do this, which pulls it away from the algorithms and you can actually say something about the instance itself. That's all. Thanks. Question for Ryan. Uh, so in the experiments that you ran on actual circuits, uh, these factors that you found, did they have any kind of reasonable interpretation? Or? I don't think that we found oh. any reasonable interpretation. <laughs> because a lot of these variables, they capture sort of various properties of certain gates. So, uh -huh. so why is this, like, and they would be kind of spread out and unrelated. So they would be sort of like, out. why would, like, some, yeah, this variable set to true if this gate has this weird oh. firing at this stage. Uh -huh. And then over here, it's something that looks totally different. Oh, I see. Yeah, we don't know why they're small and they're there. We don't. So, so, so the <coughs> if there's some kind of recursive structure of backdoor, uh -huh. uh, you know, like when you remove one backdoor, the, the, the rest of the circuit uh, are decomposing the components. They have small backdoor. So, mm -hmm. so if, if you consider that it's almost similar to a graph as a boundary tree or something, so there, there could be some other dynamic program in your uh, some recursive structure. Well, it's, I mean, the instance itself has some... Yeah, you remove, uh, uh, yeah, if someone had those back door, the things that decompose in the components, right. personally, they have a certain side of that door. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one way of, of looking at it. could be one reason why, for some of these instances, you had it. Yeah. So, so, so we're on the same Could people actually think about yeah, yeah. So the the SAT conference is a good reference to look. At this. So they often have papers about backdoors and kind. Yes, people have been tweaking SAT solvers specifically to look for these kind of things. That, but the thing is that the heuristics were already kind of implicitly finding them in, in the first place. So, I just wanted to somebody actually design solvers so that these smaller backdoors. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they have. Any more questions for Ryan?